So what's with that giant bird up on your pulpit? My parents asked one day. They had just watched one of our services on YouTube, pre-COVID, I might add, and uh, either they were just trying to kick the ball down the field and get out of having to tell me what they really thought of my sermon that day, or they were genuinely curious, but they were perplexed by this large bronze eagle staring back at them from our pulpit. It wasn't the first time I've gotten this question. Friends, visitors, even my husband, all of them have asked me on occasion, so what's with that giant eagle up at the front? I do a little bit of preaching over at St. Mark's, just up the alleyway behind me here, and as it turns out, they too have a golden eagle with its arms stretched out across the lectern. And in the church where I first learned organ lessons, all the way in Lansing, Michigan, they too have an eagle in residence. And if you do a little research, you'll find there are eagles on pulpits and lecterns all over the world. Giant birds on these giant pulpits and these giant churches all over the world. So what is it with these big birds on these big pulpits? I've been thinking a lot about our own big eagle this week inside our church because I've been thinking a lot about our own big church this week. I've been thinking about what 152 years of ministry looks like and what 152 years of ministry feels like. What kind of change and growth and transitions and transformation this community has undergone and gone through. Many of them difficult, many of them challenging. And while I know that this bronze eagle hasn't been at the front of this church building for the entire time, for the majority of it, it has been here. Looking back fiercely, holding up mirrors, holding up windows, holding up perspectives, holding us in tension, and holding us all accountable with its piercing gaze. There is, of course, the adage, if these walls could only talk, but this morning I want to push it just a little further and suggest if this eagle could talk, if this eagle could talk, because between you and me, I think it has something to say and some things that it has wanted to say for some time. I suspect that deep in its penetrating gaze inside this bronze fixture, there are more truths than we could imagine. And I suspect that if we dig down deep enough and discover why this large bird is here in this cathedral of love in the first place, we would discover that it has decades and decades of wisdom to offer us in the midst of the most unsettled and challenging times in our community for most of us. Now, I, uh, I own that I'm a bit of a research nerd, or maybe I'm just a nerd in general, but it wasn't exactly punishment for me to dive into a research project and figure out why and how and when and where eagles and other raptor-like birds made their way into sacred spaces like ours. And while I could probably present you an entire lecture series on the history of birds in Christian architecture and design, there's a few prevailing messages offered to us from the eagle and this eagle that I believe we all need to hear this week. Now, if you did your own eagle pulpit research, you would find that one of the earliest uses of the symbol of the eagle derived from the belief that the bird was capable of staring directly into the sun. They believed in the early church years that the eagle could just stare and stare all day long into the sun without flinching or looking away. And similarly, they believed that Christians could gaze unflinchingly at the revelation of the divine word. Now, I know that this is Fountain Street Church, and very few of us would use the expression, the divine word, much less crack open a Bible very often, but there's a profound beauty in that. There's a beauty in the symbolism and then the idea and in the notion that we are already enough as we are to look into truth and to look directly into opportunity and directly into mystery without flinching and without looking away. I love the idea of this bronze eagle with all of its mystery and empowered, excuse me, with all of its mystery and its power inspiring us to look directly into whatever it is that's before us. To look directly 
into whatever it is that's before us. I love that it inspires us. I love that it inspires all of us in our community to believe in ourselves and to liberate ourselves from flinching, from avoiding, or from dismissing, or from turning away. The reality is, you could substitute divine word for quite literally anything. But think with me for just a moment about where we find ourselves this week, because I know that that is the elephant in the room. This week, our community formally recognized the unexpected resignation of our senior minister. And in doing so, we learned from her own words that the existence of racism and sexism embedded in our institution were no longer sustainable for her. And that our community has work to do on dismantling the systems that allow for women and people of color to be treated poorly. And with this news came a shockwave, a shockwave that echoed through our congregation as it was met with, excuse me, with grief and anger, confusion and denial, sadness and numbness, defensiveness and rationalization, agony and virtually every other type of response and reaction that you could imagine. And what has resulted can only be described as a difficult conversation. A difficult conversation. Difficult indeed. Difficult because even as we react to the news and then react to our own reactions, we cannot divorce ourselves from the very real introspection that we have been flung into. Difficult because in many ways we were not completely or totally surprised. Difficult because it thrust us into the desert even deeper than we already thought we were, and it held up a mirror to each of us in a window up to one another and to our congregation. Difficult because we want more answers than we know we're going to get. Difficult because deep down inside, we know that the answers will need to come from within ourselves. And difficult because this is a conversation we can't run from or ignore or turn away from. And I pray we won't. And it's natural. It's natural to want to resist this. It's normal to want to avoid it and to look away or to flinch. And I admit, there are moments where I flinch. There are moments where I, I at least try to turn away from all of this. There are moments where I want to fly away, quite literally, in another direction. But there's also part of me. There is part of me that hears this call and sees the power at looking at this opportunity head on. And there's part of me that knows I have a part in this conversation too and that I cannot break my gaze from truth. And so it's in the mystery of this beautiful bronze eagle that I give pause this morning for all of us to discern what it is that we are each and we are all being called to gaze towards without flinching or looking away. But there's another part of the symbolism of the eagle that I think we all need to hear this week. And that is the idea that the eagle was so big and so strong that it could fly the highest and therefore all the way up to heaven and touch it. And because it was so big, because the eagle is so strong, it can also fly the furthest. And therefore the eagle, the one, the bird who could touch heaven could also carry heaven the furthest, thusly carrying the vision of heaven, the embodiment of heaven to the four corners of the world. And again, I know, this is Fountain Street Church, and the word heaven feels like it should come with the trigger, but we've talked about this at Fountain Street. We've talked about a liberated sense of heaven, a heaven seen as a place that's rooted and grounded in the here and in the now, not as magic way up in the sky, but as a reality in which you and I in this very congregation have a place in cultivating and making it a reality for ourselves and for others. Our shared liberated faith is rooted in love and justice and inclusion, and that in itself is a way of understanding and manifesting heaven right here and right now. And just as much as it is our pursuits to free our minds and grow our souls and to be able to live and experience and know the fullness of being human, 
so too is it our responsibility that this life will be known by and experienced by all of creation, not the least of which our neighbor. My friends, life is thriving. Life is loving. Life is being loved. Life is growing. Life is changing and it is transforming. But life like this is only sustainable in a context of a heaven on earth that works for all of us justly and equitably and rooted in the present reality in which we share. And that is precisely the kind of heaven on earth that I believe Fountain Streeters want to engage in, and that is precisely the kind of heaven on earth that I believe the symbolism of this eagle calls us each and all to embody and carry to the four corners of our world. But being alive, being fully human, experiencing the fullness of life takes work. And that kind of work requires growth and change and transformation. And that, that is precisely where we are this week, my friends. In the tradition in which I was educated for seminary, I was taught you never finish a sermon without the good news. You can't stop without the good news. I was taught that you can take a community to difficult and uncomfortable spaces and places, but you always... You always proclaim the good news, the news of hope, the news of joy and of liberation and of promise. In this morning and this week, my friends, there is plenty of good news. The good news is from where I'm standing, Fountain Street Church, this church, this church is not denying that we have work to do or that there is a journey ahead of us. This congregation is not looking away from the next chapter or from the next season ahead. And even in those moments where we flinch, even me, we look back and we turn our gaze towards the truth and the opportunity and the path before us. The good news is there are 15 members of our church's governing board, including five fiercely dedicated officers who have been working tirelessly around the clock to gaze into the next season face on. They are. And the good news is that the same thing can be said for your fiercely dedicated and passionate staff right down here at 24 Fountain. And even though, even though we represent a congregation of mixed views and experiences and opinions and feelings and any number of things, let alone what we're going through right now, you're still here. You're still engaging, and you haven't given up. And that is some damn good news. The good news is we are in this together. The good news is that we have what it takes to keep our gaze fixed on truth and enter into this next season of change together. In the Jewish stories, waters covered the earth for 40 days, and Moses stayed on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. In the Christian legends, Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and lest we forget the Buddhist tradition where the Buddha spent 40 days under the Bodhi tree. Each of these stories, all of these stories, remind us that change and transformation are only available to those who go through the journey. Growth and metamorphosis and being radically transformed are possible after a season of transformation. Isn't that some good news? Who among us would deny that this is the kind of season in which we find ourselves right here at Fountain Street? A season of transition, a season of self-discovery, and of holding up mirrors, and looking through windows, and of, and of opening ourselves up to the fullness that life has to offer. And if, if we engage this season with the courage of an eagle and on the side of love and justice and inclusion, I believe that this will also be a season of transformation for all of us. Isn't that some good news? Like an allegorical bronze eagle adorning our own pulpit, we need to look at where we are head on. We need to look at ourselves head on, and we need to look at this next chapter head on and own this part of our story. 
and not only own this part of the story, but carry this part of our story to the four corners of the world. Because my friends, the world is counting on us to do this work almost as much as we are counting on ourselves to do this work. May it be so. Amen.